in the end, you do a good job because you love doing it and not because of any other reason. Hi, my name's uh, Jeff Watts, and I'm going to be um, interviewing, doing a sequence of podcasts, and uh, both verbal and audio, uh, or verbal and uh, visual. But uh, we're going to interview all the instructors, and the point being is I'd like to get a little bit more insight into uh, the, the instructors that have been such a special part of this atelier. Um, they all were originally students uh, long ago, and now they're all uh, you know, working professionals. Many of them are my best friends, and uh, they're just amazing people. So I wanted to kind of go through a sequence of asking some questions just so you guys can get some insight into uh, what the uh, faculty at the atelier is like. And um, so we're going to talk about uh, all kinds of different aspects. Eric uh, Gist, who's going to be my first, uh, first uh, teacher that I'm interviewing, and he's a great friend of mine. I'm going to ask him a little bit about his background, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what, uh, what he's learned over the years uh, professionally, as well as, as a student and a teacher, and all those other good things. So uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, like I said, we'll be doing these with all the instructors, and uh, look forward to, uh, to some insight into the inner workings of our atelier. So. Um, Eric, uh, Eric Gist, here he is. Uh, again, he's been with me for whew, going on 15 years, maybe? Longer than that. I think maybe longer than like 15. <laughs> so we've had the atelier for 20, and, and Eric's been a big part of it as a student, and then uh, for a number of years, and then he came on fairly early as an instructor. Anyway, uh, Eric, I was just going to get a little beef background on education and jobs and where, what your background kind of is. Uh, well, I guess my first... Uh, post high school education was going to community college um, where I met uh, uh, a friend uh, actually at the time we weren't even really friends we were just in a class together and he saw me drawing out of the Bridgman book and uh, told me that there was a school downtown that I might want to check out which actually at the time not even Watts Atelier yet Jeff Watts Art Instruction <laughs> yeah, what a name. So, and uh, so uh, he told me about that and uh, he invited me to come down and uh, check out one of the classes so I did that I came down and I saw the school and that was just briefly before you went to Morocco, I think. Yeah. The only semester you've ever taken off. Yeah. Um, and so actually from the time I found out about the school, it was about six months before I actually started taking classes because that was midway through a session. And then the next session you took off and then I started that following summer. And uh, that's when I graduated from community college and I was starting at San Diego State. And what first couple of years I was in for one or two classes. And then when I graduated from San Diego State, uh, I started going more full-time, uh, which was really probably my only, only stint of full-time study at the school was, was the seven months or so between graduating from San Diego State and starting a job in video games, mm -hmm. uh, where I was taking uh, four or five, maybe six classes, as, pretty much as many as you offered I took. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I started working in video games, and uh, I cut back on the number of classes I was taking a little bit. And then shortly after that, I started teaching. Um, and then a few years later, uh, I uh, quit my job in video games, which I really enjoyed, but it wasn't really what I, where I wanted to go with my career. I wanted to be a freelance illustrator and a teacher. And you offered me to come on more full time. And I guess that was probably, what maybe, about halfway in, I guess, about probably about eight years uh, yeah. after I started the school. And uh, then I came on as a full time instructor and started pursuing freelance illustration as well. Um, so your favorite period of art and illustration, I mean, what, what, are, your, what are your favorite periods? You mean what? historically? Probably the one that's most influential on me would be uh, the, I guess it would be called the Silver Age of Illustration. Uh, the kind of 60s, 70s, you know, James Bama, Frazetta, um, you know, all those kind of guys. Um, and then also obviously the artists that they influence as well, but, but I'd say that the, that period of illustration has probably been the most influential on me. Um, huge, huge fan of James Bama's work. Also, you know, the Golden Age guys, of course, I mean, everybody likes them. There's no, I mean, Rockwell, yeah, tough to beat that, you know, yeah. so. Um, but yeah, I mean, those would probably be my, my, my three favorite periods, I guess would be the, inter or I guess movements would be Silver Age of Illustration, Orientalists, and American Impressionists. And which one of those, like, of the ones you kind of mentioned, the influences, obviously, I see a lot of, of, of you know, the uh, kind of the, the classic staging of, of Bama, the lighting, the drama, the, you know, the full value range, all that kind of good stuff. And, and, uh, and Frazetta a little bit, obviously, in yeah, the, yeah, the strength yeah. of his characters and the staging. It probably depends uh, what subject matter. Yeah. You know, subject matter, it, you know, if I feel like it fits more the oriental, like, I like, when I do my more uh, high fantasy work, you know, dragons, you know, dungeons, uh, you know, knights, 
I tend to go a little bit more with Orientals. I like the mixing of those two. Um, yeah. It just seems to kind of resonate with me. Um, when I do more uh, heroic type stuff, I do com uh, you know more standard mainstream comic book work or pulp work. Obviously, it's more James Bama. Um, and then Frizzette is just always sprinkled in there. You know, that dynamics is, is hard to beat. So you yeah. try to get a little bit of that in everything you do. Yeah. So. And so you're, that kind of leads to my next question, which is your favorite deceased artists and living artists, which you've kind of already gone through. But yeah. um, I guess that's always a tough one to answer. I mean, yeah, I mean, all the usual suspects. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's tough to be, you know, Cornwell, Sargent, Rockwell, you know, all those guys. So I guess probably... Um, I mean, as far as living, James Bama, still living. Doesn't work a lot anymore, but, you know, technically still living. Uh, well, not technically, still living. Uh, he, uh, he's, he's one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't matter, you know, I guess my point with that is that, you know, living dead all time, James Bama's one of my favorites. Um, of the young guys, that, you know, which is something we haven't really touched on, uh, is, uh, I mean, Jeremy Geddes is awesome. You know, really, really yeah. good. Um, but then again, you know, usual suspects: Gregory Manchess, uh, Donato Giancola, Phil Hale. You know, Phil Hale, obviously, yeah, huge, huge influence. Not, maybe not so much recently, but in the beginning of my career, huge, huge influence. Um, John Foster, you know, of course. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, I don't know if I mentioned Jeremy Geddes. I think I might have said mm -hmm. his name, but yeah, Jeremy Geddes is a great, great young artist. Uh, there's a young guy, Chris Ron, who's awesome, really, really good. Uh, I mean, really, just if you want to see the list of guys that influenced me that are still alive and working, just go and look at the list of artists on the LexCon website. Yeah. You know, pretty much all the guys that exhibit there, including uh, Mike Hayes, you know, yeah. one of our students, and one of the other teachers, uh, Lucas Graciano. Yeah, so, you guys have all been making huge waves in, in, in those areas with, with the... Reason. We've been doing good work. Right? Yeah. I think we've been doing good work, and we've all kind of... I mean, I, I started a little bit ahead of those guys, and but we've all kind of come up together as well, So, which yeah. has been nice to have that camaraderie and guys that you can kind of vent and bounce stuff off of. And that's so. what I like most about the school is that, I mean, amongst other things, but you guys, there's this sense, which I always had hoped would happen, but but it has there's been phases of the school where it's not been as, as present, is that... that healthy competition amongst mm -hmm. your peers, being happy for the successes of your other um, instructors and students as they come up. And I know that's something I've even battled over the years. It's just one of those things you gotta kinda grow up and realize that, you know, it's just, if you're gonna be a great teacher, you're gonna have to really take those successes as your own. It's and almost like a sibling relationship yeah, in a lot of yeah, ways. Yeah, you know, it's I, like I you like wanna to, see them succeed, but they push you, you push them. Occasionally, you know, you're, you're thinking, oh man, I wish I would've gotten that, but you know, <laughs> but there's always that in any yeah, sports, yeah. And, and you come from a heavy sports background, as do I, so I know um, we share a lot of the same, probably ways why we became such good friends and we resonated so much with each other. We come from a similar background, we grew, grew up in, in a similar same area, area. Yeah. And, uh, and all of that stuff really helps. It's almost like, um, you know, we, we can relate on so many different levels, not just art, but socially just different things we went through um yeah so that's always really really neat i think so your biggest breakthrough do you think like career wise or personally came when when do you think that those biggest breakthroughs the obvious of one would be finding a school because before i found the school i was so frustrated with the uh not so much the education but the but the the, the dr traditional drawing and painting education i was getting through the collegiate system um that i was thinking about uh, giving up on that as a career and still doing it as a hobby but i didn't think i was getting the skills to prepare me for a professional, you know, uh, avenue. Um, so finding the school was huge, obviously, because I don't think I'd be doing it if I hadn't found the school. I wouldn't be making money at it if I hadn't found the school um, for various different reasons. But one, just it started giving me the skills that I needed to produce professional level work. Um, job wise, it would probably be uh, I don't know if you'd call it a small game, but it didn't last very. Right? It only lasted about two years. But it was called Hecatome, and it was a card game that Wizards of the Coast put out. Same people do Dungeons and Dragons. And, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Magic the Gathering and that was a huge breakthrough for me it was my first real full time job where I was getting repeat work um, from the same client uh, Don Muran, a great art director over at Wizards of the Coast uh, was, uh, was giving me a lot of work off of that job which helped, uh, helped me develop because I was getting paid mm -hmm. so I could dedicate more time to my artwork because I was getting paid to do artwork <laughs> uh, you know, aside great, from yeah. teaching yeah it's always great right yeah. uh, paying the bills is always a good mm -hmm. thing um, but then that also led to uh, her uh, recommending me for work on uh, Magic the Gathering with Jeremy Cranford and, uh, and later Jeremy Jarvis. And then Jeremy Cranford uh, started working on the Warcraft, World of Warcraft mm -hmm. card game, so I got work through that. Um, Don eventually went on to doing book covers 
uh, art directing book covers, and she gave me some book cover work, which is my first book cover work. So that job just kind of... It's amazing how that trickle-down effect... Yeah. And then Jeremy's been in classes yeah, as well. Yeah, Jeremy's so. a good friend as well. So, yeah, he's, you know. he's been a great you know, asset just to the school as far as the professional, bringing those kind of professionals in, mm -hmm. and the students get to see you know, your jobs. Because that's one thing that the... A lot of the instructors do at the atelier is bring in their work that they're working on, and I always yeah, see yeah. you bringing in stuff that that you're working on for him or, or other other people. So that's a yeah. That was I mean I felt the same way about the school I went to, uh, the California Art Institute back in the day. Is that I kind of wonder where I would have been had I not. And if someone was asking me the same question, I'd you know have to say yeah. that was probably the best thing that ever. That was my breakthrough because yeah. without that, you just kind of like you said, I didn't. You just don't. It's it, the the possibilities of actually becoming a professional working consistent artist is just almost it, yeah I mean, getting that first breakthrough is huge yeah. both education wise and professional wise yeah. education wise there's becoming more and more options now yeah like when I first started the school there was oh, like man, maybe, there was like three or four maybe, yeah, in the United yeah, States yeah. Yeah. in the world maybe yeah. for that um, the most unexpected aspect of being a professional something that you just did kind of hit you out of left field maybe or something I mean was there anything in particular you know, it's it's changed so much, so it, it constantly surprises me in some ways, but in other ways, it's, it's kind of been, because I had you as sort of a, a mentor, I knew kind of what to expect, but at the same time, it's changed so much, year after year, but I mean, it's even changed a lot since you've moved more into fine art, that, you know, the, the business side of things constantly evolves, that that has surprised me constantly, how quickly the turnaround is now at each end of the painting. You know, getting the project set up and finishing the project goes so quickly now that it's nice. It's really nice. Uh, but, the, you know, like I said, it's not that much different than it's probably ever been as far as sitting down and working. Yeah, with all the new technological advances, I mean, I, I'm perplexed by the same thing you are. I mean, like the gallery industry has changed, you know, self-marketing, the ability to reach more people, all good stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, but um, I think the main thing being that we all agree on is just uh, fundamental concepts will never change. No, no, you know, it's drawing, the same. Painting. It doesn't matter what medium you work in. I yeah. mean, if, if you're working on the computer, I guess there's ways around it, but the best ones don't look for ways around it. They use the computer as just another medium. And, another tool, yeah, just like just, anything. Yeah, yeah and that's a, yeah, that's, that's a nice thing that you have such an eclectic background between the two because you can come at it from many different angles, you could produce work digitally if you wanted to, and, and have, yeah, and have. I just don't so, enjoy it yeah, yeah, I know. Personally, yeah, personally. I'm the same way. I feel the same way. I mean, what a great tool! But at the end of the day, the smell of the paint, the feel of the charcoal, yeah. the tactile Hands sensitivity. On. It's where it's at. Yeah. I mean, for us, for me, especially. Um, so let's see. If you could paint anything, I think you're probably already doing it. But if you could paint anything, what would you paint? What would you be doing? Uh, you know, like you said, I'm pretty much doing it. I mean, I love. I've always loved horror stuff so you know when I was a kid I was into horror movies I was probably watching you know Nightmare on Elm Street way earlier <laughs> before you should have been, been. <laughs> yeah. um, you know my friends and I would walk down to the local video store and the guy you know that was working there wasn't that much older than us so he <laughs> you know he was, he'd, he'd rent us movies that we probably shouldn't have been renting <laughs> That's pretty cool. I've always loved horror stuff and it's always been my favorite genre so I guess if I, if I had to pin it down to just one word monsters Monsters. You know, if I could paint, if you told me I could paint one thing for the rest of my life, it would be monsters. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so. yeah no, I, I'm always envious because I know for me, I'm all over the board. You know, my subjects change so frequently and uh, it's so nice. I mean, I've, I've known you for so long and just watching you kind of evolve into the illustrator you become. And then ultimately, I'm sure probably fine art down the road, maybe. I don't know. Well, you're what, more of a pure painter. I mean, you do it just for the love of painting. I mean, yeah. I love painting, but... I don't. Yeah, it's a vehicle to get you can your paint idea. anything and yeah. you'd be happy. Yeah. And I don't know that that's so much the case with me. Yeah, I mean, I would be, but yeah, I definitely have my preferences. For it. I think you just like <laughs> I just like to paint. Yeah, you just like to paint, which is I, awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm a passionate painter, that's for sure. So let's see, um, your favorite assignment, maybe that you've had, or favorite client client combination assignment. What would that be? Uh, the, you know, they've been so many really good ones, but if if. Again, if I had to pin it down to one job, I'm doing it right now, and that's being the uh, regular cover artist for uh, the Strain comic book that uh, is based on novels written by, uh, by Guillermo del Toro, the director, and Chuck Hogan, the uh, award-winning author. And uh, they, they did a really nice uh, series of uh, vampire books, and uh, I had already read the books, and I met uh, Guillermo del Toro at a convention, and it led to me eventually becoming the cover artist on the series from Dark Horse. Mm. Um, so it was kind of cool because I was already a fan of the books. I was already a fan of him. And uh, now I get to work with him on a regular basis. And uh, I'm, I don't know, eight covers in, I think, right now. Um, so that's been a, a kind of a dream project of mine because I, I love movies. I love horror movies. 
I love monsters, um, and so I get to basically every month get to you know <laughs> do a that's painting. A good one. Yeah, that's yeah, a good one. right. Yeah, so. And how many are you going to be doing in, in total? Do you know? Uh, you know, I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere. It's going to be three years worth of of books. We're a year in right now, so two more years. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's going to end up being you know thirty plus paintings. So yeah, that's you don't need many clients. Like I mean, as you get, yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. It's, that's it's, really it's, good. It's, 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 it's almost. I mean, it's almost like having a paycheck which yeah. is rare yeah you know, yeah you know. i know and in that freelance environment it's a feast or famine yeah. i mean it's a tough yeah my dad my whole life was a freelance illustrator so very familiar with the ups and downs the tribulations of trying to have a consistent lifestyle when you have such a erratic yeah. career i mean uh, good and passionate but wow you know having some sort of a baseline income that you know you're going to have each month which the schools provide me forever which has been nice too yeah that's like that was good for so. all of us to be able to be a little <laughs> bit more dicey or, or take more risks in our personal profession without worrying about it collapsing or even not so much risk I mean just yeah. being a, giving the opportunity to do what you want to do and not take the jobs that you have it, it really it cuts down the jobs you have to take and you yeah. get to take more of the jobs that you want to take design is, your career a little bit more yeah it's good for everyone's yeah everyone you know the, the more jobs you, you take that you don't really want to do the more mediocre work and it makes you a better so. teacher because you come in more inspired Absolutely. not so fried and yeah. you know like the, the teaching doesn't or scared you. even yeah you, know, yeah you come in a little more yeah. scared <laughs> because you just worked on a job that, that, that beat you down a little bit yeah yeah the company gets, gets shaken a little bit. Yeah. So your, I guess your future goals going forward would be, do you have aspirations of doing fine art someday? Or do you even contemplate or ponder that as, a, as another career? Maybe as a second career way down the road? Maybe. I mean, I, right now I would say no. Only because, I, again, monsters, you know? The, yeah. The line is getting so blurred now, too, that, I mean, there's so many... Especially with so few people doing original paintings for illustration, there's becoming more and more of a market for original paintings. Fine, for, almost fine illustration. Yeah, fine illustration, fine art, basically. You know? yeah. yeah, I mean, they're calling it imaginative realism. You know, mm -hmm. they took the name from uh, Gurney's book, which is a great book, by the way. Um, awesome book. If you haven't read it, read it. Um, it. But it's it's becoming a whole almost fine art movement in and of itself that just happens to have a commercial origin and has evolved into more of a fine art rather than the, sort of the way that fine art typically works where you start out being a fine artist and you sort of have to bend things to be a little more commercial because again you have to pay the bills yeah you know yeah, it's nice to say you get to paint whatever you want. yeah right yeah. yeah i mean paint whatever you want you know as long as it sells yeah and so yeah well that's yeah because i i always remember when we first uh first met um you were toying around a little bit with the western genre a little bit of influences obviously, which i still love which you still love because yeah. that's part of your family background it's part of where you come from so you would be actually more apt to do it honestly than a lot of people i know but um that always but your wife who we will interview in a in a, in a future podcast uh meadow guest whom you guys met at the atelier um, is obviously uh, going down that particular yeah, yeah, right. avenue. Like, so you're yeah. kind of living yeah. like here's. I mean, you you don't you probably see yeah. that side of it a little bit more. And I get to kind of help her out, yeah. which so sort you, of scratches that or itches that yeah, scratch yeah. a little bit. <laughs> there, I guess. There you go. So yeah, yeah. And she gets to use a lot of stuff that I've collected over the years. You know, the the books, the reference books, the costumes that I started buying back when I thought I might do Western work. Yeah, she gets to use a little bit. Yeah. So. it's been fun to watch both of you guys. Uh, I mean, because again. As a teacher, you know, originally your guy's teacher, you know, you kind of see this a little bit of an inkling of maybe what might become, you know, what, it, assuming that the proper protocol is followed, sure, but sure. you never know who's going to derail yeah. or, you know, at some point have to move on and do something else. But um, yeah. I guess that the, we'll start wrapping this up a little bit, but the, um, what's on your easel right now? What do you, well, you probably one of those one of those covers or? actually ironically um nothing nothing right right at this very second I, <laughs> I i have nothing on my easel for probably the first time in six months man i i actually have had a i haven't day heard that very off. often from I know, you know, dude. <laughs> i know i have actually had a day off you today which has been awesome like yeah, yeah, man. Showbiz. It's, it's been crazy but i mean the this morning i got up and and uh and I got a little workout in, and, and uh, unfortunately I had to drop my dog off to have some surgery, but, you know, it's... Life stuff. Yeah, you know, life stuff, but, but it's been nice, you yeah, know. Yeah, that's nice. great to hear, because I know how hard you've been grinding it, and I, I've been on that, that treadmill for so long, and at, at some point you just kind of wonder what someone's ability to handle that kind of workload will be, you know, because you just don't know until they're doing it, and they don't even know. <laughs> yeah. So watching you go through kind of what I was, I mean, you were kind of... There was a period there where um, you know you were kind of teaching the mass amount of classes I used to, yeah, nine at one and point. trying to <laughs> and trying to do your your stuff. And I remember trying to do a freelance illustration career, a fine art career, and then teach you know ten twelve classes a week. And I was yeah. like in my twenties, so that helps. But 
Yeah, you can't be doing that for forever. And same with me. I was I was in my twenties at the time. Yeah, and there, a lot of all nighters. Yeah, a lot of all nighters. But at you know at a certain at some point something's got to give. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just happy to see. Well, not only your evolution, but but also you know what a lot of people don't know about like myself and you is that we're you know you're you're, you're back into heavy athletics and that's helped mm -hmm. a lot from what okay. I've watched. Um, and that's something I, talk, I think the viewers need to know. And I kind of talk a lot about this with my students is just that. It is a physically demanding. It, you, you think of painting as not being physical, but it is. You're in awkward positions. Your body is in not ergonomic yeah. positions, so you end up getting a lot of really funny aches and pains and, and stresses that are uh, repetitive in nature. And the the working out just gives you more energy and helps you to combat that. Well, not to mention the mental stress that comes along with yeah. you know deadlines and 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 quality assurance that's kind of all on your shoulders. You don't have someone. You know, telling you that's not good, you have to kind of constantly judge yourself. The buck stops with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you have gallery owners and art directors that yeah. obviously chime in, but in the end, it's your name that's on it, and and you have to do the best job you can do, and in a timely fashion. So, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stress, a lot of mental stress that working out helps alleviate. Yeah, I, I I've always felt that way. And without it, I don't, you know, I, I would have been a major stress case. <laughs> well, what what would your? I guess we'll we'll wrap it up here. But what is your? I guess suggestions or advice to the younger aspiring and I know probably what this answer is going to be but but <laughs> of the aspiring students that are, are coming out nowadays because the competition is getting way greater I mean in all arenas from what I've seen with all the different well again when you're talking about the you know we were talking about the digital thing earlier is that you're now competing with people all over the world you know you're not competing with the best people in New York you know, the best people in Chicago or the best people in Kansas City or wherever you are, San Diego. Yeah. You're now competing with literally the best artists all over the world because they can get them. Yeah. You know, they don't have to ship a painting you know, all the way around the world. They can hire some guy in China and, you know, they can sort of muddle their way through with some sort of automated, you know, translation program yeah, and yeah. do the job. <laughs> and send it over the computer so and they're willing to work a lot cheaper and a lot of them are really well trained yeah 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 absolutely um so i guess my advice is first um make sure you love it that, that's that's the biggest thing because if you don't love it it's gonna be there's man there's a lot easier ways to make money out there that's for sure um so make sure you love it and get a good education um those would probably be the two biggest things is, and one will lead to the other. You know, if, if you get a good education, it certainly helps you love something because the frustration level with just the fundamentals goes way down. Um, and also your love of it will drive you to find the right place to get the education. You know, you won't be satisfied, much as I wasn't satisfied with um, the, the fundamental education I was getting in college. It, if you don't love it, you'll just say, oh, you know, it's good enough and I'll do okay and, and, and I'll get by and then you quickly find out that you won't. But um, if you have that love, you don't satisfy, you don't, you're not satisfied with mediocrity. You, you expect the best from yourself because you love it and you expect the best from your education because you love it and you respect the craft and it's something more than a job. As any professional artist, especially freelance, um, learns really quickly, it is more than a job. Mm -hmm. It's not something you don't clock in and clock out. Even if it's good enough for the client, many times it's not good enough for you. Um, there's other extenuating circumstances that come into affecting the quality, but in the end, you do a good job because you love doing it, and not because of any other reason. You know, there's I do several jobs that I am lucky if I make minimum wage on. Yeah, once you clock your the hours yeah, put into it. Yeah, um, because. I want to do a good job yeah. and good jobs lead to getting better jobs and also just, you know, personal enrichment because you yeah. love what you do. You <laughs> yeah, right. Craft. Yeah. You want to put the best work out there. And in, in a lot of ways, every piece you do becomes a personal piece. Um, if you're doing it right, you know, every piece that does end up becoming, no matter how obscure the job and how much you originally took it because you had to pay for a bill. Mm -hmm. You know, in the end, once you get working on it, all that goes away and it becomes you and the canvas and how good a job can I do? Yeah. So fortunately, I've been very fortunate because of the breaks and uh, hard work I've put in both that I've gotten um, that I have ended up where probably further than I ever thought I'd be, to be honest. Yeah. You know, I thought, you know, if 18-year-old if, if me would have looked at 38-year-old me and, and seen what I was doing 
he'd think I made it. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's still, it's a long haul and there's a lot of hard work to be put in still, but he'd be looking at me going, man, that's yeah, awesome. You know, <laughs> and I think every once in a while you almost have to stop and get back to that 18 year old and say, yeah, hey, look how far I've come. Yeah. You know, cause it, it is a long road. And I think if you're, you know, if you're, if you're prepared for it mentally, and I think that's one of the things I was lucky that watching my father, I had a career before I had a career. So I understood the trials and tribulations that I was going to go through far before I ever even had this before I even went in to get skills so I was prepared oh man that's 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 a rough living yeah and it, it has you know kind of tempered my whole way that I've chosen to, to live my life whether you have kids or not whether you have a family what you're gonna do I mean it's all you know important decisions and sacrifices you got to do to be the best you can yeah. but, um, and then nowadays you really have to to to, uh, to excel mm -hmm. so um, I really appreciate you taking the time to come in. Obviously, we've known each other forever, and we're good friends, so <laughs> it wasn't too hard. But uh, but it was uh, it's something I really I, I want to kind of um, you know finish by saying that you know these people really have made my life so much better as well. So it's a give and take that's been equal, I think, on all levels. And that's one of the few things one of the things I'm most proud of with the Atelier is that um, you know it is a give take where it's a win win for everybody. We've all benefited greatly from what it is and I never had anticipated it becoming that so it's always kind of been kind of a surprise to see what actually it happened like I, if I went back like Eric said to 18 I would have never envisioned what where I'm at right now or what what had transpired and I hope that this is just the beginning but um, but anyway yeah these people will be my lifelong friends and and I want to kind of share with the viewers and the people that maybe listen to this a little bit more about the insights of our instructors so that they can know how special people they are, you know, to me as well as to, to our students. Um, so hopefully uh, that wraps up this little interview and I thank you, Eric, for coming in. It was <laughs> awesome. And uh, we'll continue to do this. So um, we'll have another instructor to interview here shortly. So join us again for more insights into the inner workings of the Atelier. Thank you very much. Awesome. Cool. Cool. So hey. we'll, see, we'll see how the, the audio